Hello, Kerry. Hello, how are you? Good, brother. How you doing? I'm very good. I'm, I'm actually a little bit nervous to meet you too because I'm a huge fan. Thank you for... Ah, well, we appreciate that. Thank you. Don't, for... don't be nervous. We are we are two very average, normal guys, but uh, but we appreciate your fandom. My gosh, and and it seems like you're doing some great work. Hopefully, man. Hopefully, I'm, you, I'm trying my best. Tell me. Where are you? I'm in uh, at my house. Okay, this is a back screen, but I'm from Cyprus. Cyprus. Do you know Cyprus? You bet. Oh, that's cool. That's cool. So, are you, are you ready to start? Definitely. Hey, the um, our producer is not here right now, mm -hmm. and our, our camera guy. So, is the lighting bad, or is the lighting okay? No, it's good. It's good. It's good. It's good? Okay. Mm -hmm. Are you in San Francisco? No, no, that's his background. He's in <laughs> Cyprus. Oh, oh, you're in Cyprus. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, thank you for coming to the podcast. It's, it's such a pleasure to meet you guys and ask you some questions. You're one of my favorite, like, YouTubers and, like, people that do Christian apologetics, if it's the right right word to use. So starting off, for the people that don't know you, please introduce yourself, who you are, and your story, and how you got started. Uh, my name is Cliff, and I've been speaking on university campuses around the United States for about 40 years. And it started when uh, I got very frustrated with uh, my work with InterVarsity Christian Fellowship because I uh, would speak at night and only Christians would show up and uh, I wasn't getting to many unbelievers. And one day, uh, a, a man who was a father in the Lord to me named Leighton Ford said, Cliff, I was speaking at the University of Arizona and I saw a hell, hellfire brimstone preacher stand up and tell all the students they were going to hell in a handcart. Damn. And stood around and listened and got angry with him. So why don't you go out there and try and present both the love and the truth of Christ? So 40 years ago on the beaches of Fort Lauderdale, Florida, during spring break, I stood up on the beach and began to preach. Students hopped off their towels, started firing questions at me. I scrapped my outline and started dialoguing with them. And heaven stopped since. Damn, man. The, uh, That's nice. <clears throat> the YouTube channel is Ask Cliff or, or Give Me an Answer. You can hit either one. And basically, that's just... Videos from, I, I think the videos are from the last 10 years, but especially him, he's been doing a, a TV show that's local and some throughout the U.S. And it may even be on some random satellites there in Cyprus. <laughs> so it, uh, it's in different places. And it's just, yeah, it's a blast doing this together. I've only been doing it for six years. Mm -hmm. Like you said, he's been doing it for 40. Damn. And growing up, you know, I used to travel, live out of a suitcase with him. And especially at like the California schools at Berkeley and some of those other crazy kind of liberal schools, mm -hmm. there would be guys out there spitting on him, throwing pies at him, coming Damn. out with fake guns. One story, one of my favorite stories is this guy came out and dropped his drawers and had uh, John 316 <laughs> written on his, on his backside, mooning the crowd. And so you see all kinds of crazy stuff, you know, you know even though it's kind of gotten a little tamer, maybe, maybe in this day and age. We still see wild stuff. You know, guys will run out uh, threatening to break the cameras. They'll throw stuff. Um, oftentimes we'll get you know, hyper feminists coming out saying that this should not be going on. Mm -hmm. There should be no such thing as debating, only gentle, sensitive, conversing. So there's all, you know, right now it's, it's especially here in the U.S., it's obviously a, a great opportunity, a fascinating time to have these types of debates because mm -hmm. it's a very politically correct culture. And uh, if there's a real need for it, so it's fun. Yeah, that's cool. God bless you, man. I hope God gives you strength and patience and safety so they don't break your cameras or do anything mm -hmm. bad to you guys. So my next question is like, how should people read the Bible? Because although you may answer lots of questions, it's good for people to answer those, those questions for themselves in order to then answer the questions for others. Like teach a man how to fish. Don't give don't don't go give him a fish. Do you know? Good question, Kiri. I would encourage people to read the Bible the same way they read anything. When you read a a book, hopefully you are reading in context. 
you're not ripping one line out of a fellow by Shakespeare and saying, okay, this is Shakespeare's worldview. Instead, you read in context. And the second thing I hope that we all do is we uh, respect literary style. If it's a science textbook, we read it as science. If it's historical work, we read it as history. If it's a poem, we read it as poetry. If it's a myth, we read it as mythology. So respect literary style. And if you will do those two things, read in context and respect literary style, which I hope you will do with any book that you pick up and read, I think that the Holy Spirit will lead you to, uh, to truth, the truth that's found in Jesus Christ. I would just add to that too. Oftentimes, I, I encourage people to start with the Gospel of John. Uh, it's so under, you know, it's so easy a six-year-old can understand it, but then you get into, say, Ecclesiastes, and there's a lot of nihilism, nihilism, pronounced both ways, and it's pretty dark, especially when just considering a world, a universe without God. It's all about just everything under the sun, and everything is just going to die out in the end, so you can live any which way you want. And we see some of that on college campuses. Some atheists will be honest and say, yeah, there's no meaning or purpose to life. I'm going to die after 70, 80 years, and so I, I should do whatever I want, and it's pretty depressing. Others will say, no, you can just make up a meaning, and no, there truly is subjective meaning and purpose without a God. So that's another discussion, but it, it's connected to reading, like Cliff was saying, literary style, genre, understanding what the author's intent is, understanding context and who it is written to is very important, because we, mm -hmm. we just had a debate on, for example slavery with some pretty big atheists and slavery in the old testament specifically and understanding context understanding was it slavery like during the antebellum era and age during here in the u.s and did god actually say go out and kill certain races and enslave them and rape their wives so understanding context context is king is is a line that i like mm -hmm. to go with and then asking questions and allowing people to doubt so I know a lot of people who never came to the faith or who weren't allowed to ask people of the faith, you know, pastors, whoever it might be, any questions. That was, they were shamed if they asked questions of the Bible. But, you know, the book of Jude talks about it, being honest and open, being patient with non-believers. You know, obviously, 1 Peter 3.15, be able to give a reason for the hope that you have. Obviously, Jesus saying over and over again, come and see, come and check it out. There's so many different passages in Scripture that encourages doubt, encourages truth seeking, honestly, and asking hard questions of the text rather than just, hey, yeah, I grew up in this faith, this religion, and <laughs> it's my parents' faith, and I don't really ask any questions. You know, I just blindly believe. Yeah, very good responses. Um, next question. If you could go back in time and give yourself advice, what would you give yourself? What would you tell yourself? Better question for you. Love God and love people more. <clears throat> mm -hmm. Very good answer. What about you, Stuart? Yeah, that's a that's a. T I would have a, a better answer if I was at least forty five. But <laughs> I, I would say, gosh, I, I would say check out more worldviews, more religions, uh, at a deeper level at an earlier age, and then get committed to one don't just remain agnostic and say oh i'm not going to commit to any worldview or any religion or anything like that because obviously that is a worldview in and of itself mm -hmm. but instead to take them seriously rather than you know a, a frequent line that i hear is oh i don't I, I don't have any faith i don't i don't take part in any religion i don't take part in any any of that type of thing instead everything is just science and that's all I need to know about worldviews, all I need to know about spirituality or religion or anything like that. And so I was sort of there at one point, but I, you know, it wasn't until college that I really started digging into worldviews. And so if, if I, one thing that I would tell a, a younger me would, would be to really try and, and buckle down and, and learn as much as possible mm -hmm. about worldviews and religions as early as, as possible. Mm -hmm. So w what do you think, keeps people that do their research that are maybe atheists or Muslims, let's say that atheists are like um, Matt Dillahunty or like Aaron Array that you do like debates with, those two atheists, what keeps them atheists? Because is their research not enough? There's no like conclusion with historical evidence? What? It's another great question. It is a great question. 
many different reasons. I don't think there's one. Mm -hmm. I think the first reason, though, that people reject Christ is because they don't want to submit to his lordship. In other words, I want to be in control. In other words, I want to write the rules. In other words, I have an agenda in life, and I want my agenda to be honored. And obviously, when I bump up against God, when I bump up against Jesus, I am bumping up against a personal being who has a will. And so now I'm going to have to make a decision. Is it going to be my will or God's will? My will or Christ's will? And that's very intimidating. That's very uncomfortable. So Jesus makes mm -hmm. me uncomfortable because he makes a bunch of truth claims. And because of his truth claims, because he has a will, because he's a personal being, not an it, not a, a vague principle whirling around in outer space. Therefore, it's either going to be his will or it's going to be my will. And I don't want his will to be done. I want my will to be done. And so that's a very, very good uh, reason for me to run away from God. I think the only reason an atheist doesn't find God is for the same reason that a criminal does not find the police. He's always running away. Mm -hmm. And there's a good reason to run away. I don't want to do God's will. I want to do my will. I want to play God. So I think that's first reason. Second reason, there is such a thing as prejudice and bias. Mm -hmm. And I have been prejudiced at times. I've been biased at times. And that is because of my intellectual laziness. I don't want to do the research. I don't want to do the homework. I just want to believe whatever I believe easily, quickly, without too much work. And that is a great definition of prejudice. Prejudice is I don't have time or the desire to do the work, the study. So therefore, I'm just going to go with what comes easiest to me. And so I feel that there are many people who are prejudiced and biased against God, against Christ. And they're not willing to do the work. They're willing to ask questions, but then they're not willing to go back and do the homework necessary to answer those questions. I mean, it's rather simple, to tell you the truth. If I'm smart enough to ask hard questions, I'm smart enough to go and study the evidence. Although I not necessarily can get a order to answer, still, uh, if I'm smart enough to ask the hard questions, I'm smart enough to go and do the homework, the research necessary. Mm -hmm. And then uh, a third issue is this whole issue of mystery. Too many people think that I'm going to have all the answers to all the difficult questions. Friends, that's not true in any area of knowledge. Is there a biology postdoc who knows all the answers to all the biological questions? Obviously not. Is there a chemist who has five PhDs in chemistry who knows all there is to know about <laughs> chemistry? No, false. None of us have exhaustive knowledge in any area. We have to live with unanswered questions. We have to live with mystery. And so often I find that people find it very difficult to live with mystery. Although they have to live with mystery, often they're not aware of the fact that they are living with mystery. And therefore, when they begin to think seriously about Christ or God, all of a sudden, because the mysteries are there, they pull back. Be consistent. You have to live with mystery. In every human relationship you have, with your best friend even, there is mystery involved. You cannot tell me everything there is to know about your best friend. I can't tell you everything there is to know about my best friend. There's a tremendous amount of mystery in life, and we have to face that fact and learn to live with that. Those two specific guys especially, one of them once said, if my name was spelled in the sky, so-and-so, I exist, and you are a great guy, I would still not believe it was God who wrote that. Another one of them said to me, he said, oh, yeah, you believe in this Jesus and in the book of Matthew. This Jesus talks about he came to divide families and to hate your mother and father in, in relation, at least, to me. And so you start to see many of the, the things that Cliff just stated, you start to see some of these smoke and mirrors that's going on and how deeply emotional this issue is for even them. You know, they both do this full time and they've been doing debates mm -hmm. for a very, very long time and they do it daily. So they obviously have great knowledge, but they often will say stuff like, I need strong evidence or you need to prove that Jesus Christ actually is the son of God and that God even exists to me in order for me to believe. And then they start moving the goalposts. And what I mean by that is you'll start to give them perhaps strong evidence, but they'll say, no, that's not strong. Here's what I mean by strong. 
And then you'll get to another point and they'll say, well, no, I want this type of evidence. I want scientific proof. And so if you hear the hear them speak and, and they'll be convincing at times, but then they'll make these statements where they'll rip scripture out of context. Obviously, Jesus is not saying to hate your father and mother or that he's coming to literally turn family members against each other. No, it's in relation to him. That's how much we're supposed to love him in comparison to family members. And there's great reason for that. We flourish as human beings when we put God at the very top. When you put a career, when you put a family member at the very top, we know life goes very poorly. Mm -hmm. And then the other guy's saying, even if all the stars aligned and wrote me a message, I still would not believe in God. I mean, come on. <laughs> That's showing your true colors, unfortunately. And they're very convincing until they start making statements like that. And then you start to say, oh, okay. So why are we even debating right now? Mm -hmm. That's very sad because I don't think they they realize how important this is. Because our life here on Earth is so, insign so small or insignificant, however you want to say it, compared to the life we're going to live in the afterlife, like in heaven or hell. And I think they don't even contextualize how different is hell and heaven? Hopefully, mm. pray to God they will change and um, find a way towards God. What do you think keeps Muslims or Jews that have done their historical evidence not yet believing that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and he has resurrected from the dead? Is there not enough historical evidence to make such a conclusion? Well, the majority of my Muslim friends have made a real blunder when it comes to who do you trust to be your primary source of information about Jesus? Matthew and John were two of the apostles, the 12 apostles. Mark saw Christ as a person I don't think. He knew the eyewitnesses very well. So we're talking about people who lived with Christ, heard him speak, watched him perform miracles, saw him risen from the dead, or at the very least, in the case of Luke, knew the eyewitnesses who had seen Christ risen from the dead. Are they a more reliable source of information? Or is a guy who lived 500 years after the fact, Muhammad, who obviously never met Jesus, is he a more reliable source of information about Jesus? In the Gospels, the claim is clear. Jesus is God. In the Quran, it's crystal clear. Jesus is not God. So we obviously have a contradiction. Now, the question is, who is more reliable? The writers who saw Christ, who wrote the Gospels, or Muhammad, a man who was born 500 years after Christ. Obviously, he never met Christ. He never saw Christ. And, sir, I, I think the answer to that is rather obvious. Any time that I'm studying history, if I want to get to know an historical figure, if I want accurate information, I want the eyewitness recounts. Mm -hmm. So that's, I think, the issue for my Muslim friends. Who are you going to trust to tell you the truth about Jesus? The eyewitnesses or a guy who was born 500 years after the fact who obviously never met Christ? And then with my Jewish friends... The first challenge is, are they Orthodox, Conservative, or Reformed Jews? And I think many, many Jews here in the United States, at least, are Reformed, which means they're not even sure that there is a supernatural God, and they've reduced, Christian they've reduced Judaism in a very similar way that many Protestants have in the United States, reduced Christianity, to simply a code of ethics. So my Reformed Jews friends are often very nice people who have, have reduced religion to be a nice guy. The same way many of my Protestant Christian friends here in the United States have reduced Christianity to just be a nice guy. So I think that's a big mistake that both my Jewish and Protestant friends are making. No, the heart of true religion is to know God in a personal way. Then when it comes to my conservative Jewish friends, I think that uh, tradition is too powerful an issue. 
I, I respect the emphasis on tradition. I respect the emphasis on family in my Jewish cons conservative Jewish friends. And yet I think you've got to be open minded and look at the Old Testament, the New Testament with an open mind, not just depend on your tradition. Mm -hmm. And that is even more true of my Orthodox Jewish friends. You talk about people committed to tradition. Wow. It's off the charts. And I think the question is not so much what is my tradition, rather the question is what is true? Is Jesus the truth or not? So what I often like to ask my Jewish friends is why do you trust your tradition so deeply? What's the evidence that your tradition is true? Obviously there are many benefits to your tradition. It has kept the people together for a few thousand years. And I respect that. I respect that highly. And yet when it comes to conclusions about who Jesus is, is he Messiah, is he Messiah or not? I think we have to be open-minded and look at the evidence, not just look at tradition. Mm -hmm. And just a brief point on can those people groups, are they given a fair shake when it comes to knowing Christ, knowing God? And I would say it's clear that they have or that they will based out of Romans chapter one, Romans chapter two. You know, they may not get special revelation in the sense of really scriptures in their hand. I think most will, but in terms of scriptures in their hands and being able to read every page for themselves, but they'll get general revelation. Will that cue them into the heart of God or not? So I, I think it's important to remember. Yeah. My answer would be similar when it comes to Muslims, especially a lot of Muslims in the U S come to know Christ by looking at manuscript ev evidence between the Quran and the Bible. And then a lot of Jews, I get a little bit frustrated with a lot of my Jewish friends because they just won't look at, say, Isaiah chapter 53 or other passages in Isaiah, I think it's 41 as well, that clearly are pointing to a suffering servant, clearly are pointing to Christ. I mean, it couldn't be any clearer. It's, it's, it's not, you know, it's not Jerusalem. It's not somehow a nation. It's not, mm -hmm. it's not these things. It's pointing to Jesus as Lord and Savior. But it, it's easy that we'll get from atheists like, oh, so they're all going to be in hell, huh? Is that right? But it's no. I mean, look at the Pharisees. Jesus said, was able to read their hearts. Read their hearts. That comes up often. And in Mark chapter 2, you'll remember the paralytic is brought down through the roof to Jesus. And Jesus does not say, repent first. No, his sins are already forgiven because he reads the guy's heart. And so Jesus, God's going to read all these hearts. It's not like every single one of them literally has to bend their knee and say, Jesus, you are God, and confess that with their mouths. I mean, we get that in Scripture, absolutely, but we get also way more in Scripture in terms of general revelation. And based off of the knowledge we receive from God, what is our response to that? And are our hearts truly open? Mm -hmm. So let me get that right, Stuart. You th you're trying to say that maybe pos pos maybe, there's possibility maybe there's a possibility that Muslims or Jews or people that believe in other religions would not go to hell because they don't believe in Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior? So I'm not going the universalistic approach. It, there's a little bit of risk in what I just said right there because it could easily be interpreted as, oh, so all people are going to heaven. Mm -hmm. Or there's a big, right now, kind of push with some of my friends where it's, well, you know, there's gradations. There's levels in heaven. And Hitler's still going to be in heaven, but he'll be on like the fourth level. <laughs> because a lot of people have a disgust towards any idea of hell. So my point is more so towards just because somebody would not say Jesus Christ is Lord does not mean that God has not revealed himself. The true God, the Judeo-Christian God, has not <laughs> revealed himself in a specific way to them. Now, most I think it is clearly Jesus Christ. You know, one of the number one ways Muslims are coming to know Christ right now is I have I have friends in different Muslim countries, Saudi, for example. Many Muslims are coming through dreams where Jesus actually meets them. And they don't know who Jesus is. You know, a, a, an atheist who's a, a cynic will say, oh, that's because you know, a missionary reached them and it's brainwashing. And all of a sudden they have this dream. Delusion. Exactly. An illusion. Right. They go down all these different types of trails. But that's simply not the case. And so I want to steer clear of saying, you know, oh, no, it doesn't matter if it's Jesus or not. It's just, you know, they have to have humility and some type of aloof, diffuse faith. That's not what I'm saying. I am saying, though, that God meets us in different ways and coming to know him and eventually Jesus Christ is incredibly important. But how that how that really comes to be, I think the whole, whole born again movement 
is a little bit risky because the whole born again movement is here's the cookie cutter approach to coming to know Christ. And it absolutely has to be done in a church, in a pew, or you're not really a believer. And then you have to be baptized with water or you're not a believer. And so I steer clear of that. I say, okay, wow, you're, you're really minimizing what Christ, what God can do in the hearts of others. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great response. Next question that I'm having a trouble myself is I'm trying to listen to God more. How, because in my prayer, I used to only speak and ask for God's stuff, thank Him and all this stuff. But now I actually want to listen to Him, take time and actually listen to Him because I want it to be a dialogue, not a monologue. And I think many people just think as prayer as a monologue. However, if I tell them like, you should listen to God more, like listen to Him, what He has to say to you. How do I know that God is speaking to me and it's not my conscience? Very good question, brother. But help me pronounce your name again. Kiri. Kiri. Kiri, that's a very good question. It's something that I struggle with, Kiri, myself on a regular basis. The question is that you put so well, how do I know whether it's God's voice that I'm listening to or whether it's my own voice just talking to myself? The reason it's such a hard question is because our wills are so strong, it's too easy for me to have a desire for me to say something to myself that I want and then to baptize it with a statement, oh, that's God speaking. Yeah, baloney. Too often that's been me speaking to myself <laughs> because I have a very strong will. So it's a very thoughtful, very sensitive question. I think there are a lot of ingredients that go into the complex question you've raised. The first point is the importance of humility. Pride is... It's all about what Cliff says. Humility is, it's all about what Christ says. And I want to do Christ's will. And if I don't have a humility before God, it's going to be almost impossible for me to hear the voice of God, because really all I'm hearing is my own voice talking to myself. Mm -hmm. Humility is crucial, first point. Second point is repentance is crucial. Repentance shows that I really want to submit to God's will. I have done wrong. Lord God, forgive me for the wrong that I've done. I want to turn away from that wrong. And by your grace, with the help of your Holy Spirit, I want to live a different way. So I'm humble. I'm growing in humility. I'm struggling against my pride. Secondly, I'm repenting. And I'm actively turning away from wrongdoing, asking Christ for forgiveness and for his grace and his Holy Spirit to change. Thirdly, I've got to be reading the Bible because that is clearly God speaking. So he's given me a Bible, and the Bible answers a lot of my questions when it comes to what is God's will, what is God's plan. I never have to ask the question, does God want me to lie? Does God want me to commit adultery? Does God want me to be greedy? Does God want me to covet? No, it's real clear. No, Cliff, don't go down that path. But then obviously there are a tremendous number of difficult questions that I have to answer, like how much money should I keep for myself, and how much should I give away? Mm -hmm. Now that's a very hard question for me. And I need to really struggle through what the scriptures say. And then I need to pray and say, okay, Lord, I need you to guide me. The next point would be wisdom. The Bible talks a lot about wisdom. And I think that wisdom is being able to take God's word and apply it to the everyday decisions that I have to make. And so I want to grow in wisdom. I need to ask God for wisdom in order to honor him in the decisions I make. And I think that as I obey him, as I trust him, as I ask him for wisdom, as I grow in humility, as I learn to read his word, to meditate on it, to give him my attention, that I can begin to become more and more confident that it's not just Cliff talking to Cliff, but instead God is talking to me and guiding me. But then, brother, what's really frustrating is when I have a decision to make, and I don't really hear the voice of God very clearly. It's murky. It's cloudy. That gets to be a little disconcerting for me, to tell you the truth. I begin to feel a little bit insecure. And I think at that point, I need to rest in the fact that God is good. He's not going to allow me to waste my life. If I really have a desire to do his will, he will communicate to me through a small voice inside, through a circumstance, through another person, through his word. So I need to be confident that because of his goodness, he's not going to allow me to take a bad detour. 
And then secondly, I need to remember, he gave me a free will for a purpose mm -hmm. to exercise it. So I can't go through life being paralyzed. Oh no, oh no, I haven't heard a clear word from God. So I can't make a decision. No, it's like God is saying to me, Cliff, I gave you a free will, use it responsibly. So that's part of how I work through the issue. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just to add to that, what he initially said in terms of read the Bible, be in it, read it formationally and informationally. Formationally is taking a smaller section of scripture, asking tough, tough questions of the text, and literally taking two verses and maybe spending 20 minutes just on those two verses for two days both days. So, so 40 minutes in all in, in just two verses and, and asking the questions, what is God saying? What is this revealing? What is he saying to me in my heart and how am I going to respond? And that's a form of prayer, contemplation, meditation. Don't forget in the Psalms, David is frequently actually talking to his soul. And that's a form of prayer connected to prayer. He's not, he's not directly praying to God. Why are you downcast on my soul? Why so disturbed within me? You know, he's getting out of depression and anxiety by doing that it's a form of monologue but then he's obviously getting a response from god perhaps in a more audible way than we get today but i know for me the holy spirit connects with me i'm walking in line with the holy spirit in a way deeper more consistent way when i'm in the text reading also informationally which is read just as fast as possible as much as possible you know the 90-day bottle bible that's that's the whole informational approach and, and once you get there, it's fascinating. In my life, I just notice when I'm walking with the Spirit, by reading Scripture more, asking tough questions of it, praying to God, then all of a sudden, I am just wiser. I make wiser decisions without having to think about what decision to make. And I think that is God actually speaking to my heart, responding to my monologue in a way that's very gracious and saying, okay, watch what I can do now here through your own spiritual disciplines. Mm -hmm. I, th I think a point to add here is that, in my opinion, I think people should practice on a daily basis meditation because when you practice meditation where you focus on your breath and you calm down your mind, then you can tune out your voice and you leave out space in order to be filled with God. You may, you may go to the mountains and take for a walk by yourself and just take one hour peace time, nothing, just with God, focusing on your breath, clearing your thoughts in order to be filled in with God talking. Because how can God talk to you when you're talking, when you're having thoughts? So I think that's a very, that's that's a a very point. Good, point. good point that people should start incorporating more in their daily life to, if they want to actually listen to God. Well put, Curry. Uh, what I love about that answer too, I mean, you just spoke to me in a powerful way. But I love whenever Jesus got busier and busier in his ministry, the more he left for those mountains to pray to God and how countercultural and just that's not intuitive whatsoever because you think, OK, I'm getting busier and busier. And obviously we all have cell phones now and more and more social media. So that internal chatter is always going as mm -hmm. opposed to like you just beautifully put, get out somehow, focus on your breath, focus on a mantra and God connects in different ways that way. Mm -hmm. um, next question is how do people get get to heaven. People say that die, Jesus Christ died for your sins, so he, all, your, all your your payment for your sins are paid for. But then the question is, should I continue sinning? You might say no because you must love God, because God said you must love me. But the, the payment for your sins has already been paid. So it's a little bit vague for me how to actually get into heaven. If there was any way to go to heaven other than the cross of Christ, why on earth did Jesus go through that horrendous experience? Mm -hmm. But Jesus clearly taught that the way to heaven is through his death on a cross. And he went through agony on that cross and cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? So, yes, the way to heaven is through faith in Jesus Christ, that he did something for me that I cannot do for myself. He gave his life to pay the just penalty for my wrongdoing. And when I put my faith in him, he forgives me and gives me a gift, eternal life. Then why do I obey him? Because my faith is in him. If I have a genuine faith 
it will be shown in a lifestyle of obedience to Christ. If my faith is a hypocritical faith, then no, I'll just say that I believe in Jesus and pay lip service to him, but I'm not allowing him to change my heart. In other words, if I can trust Christ for heaven, then I think I can trust him for today. And to trust him for today means to obey him, to take what he says seriously. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that's good. I, I think one that we've talked a lot about recently is so many people, even in our church who, who've been coming for a long time, think it's just be a better person, be a better person, be a mm -hmm. better person. And that is so deeply ingrained. Oh, my gosh. I mean, I mean it could be a guy who has two PhDs, has been walking <laughs> with God, I mean, supposedly walking with God for two decades. And still, you'll sit down and have a conversation with him and he'll say, oh, yeah, I've really tried really hard this year. And I think, you know, I'm headed toward, towards heaven. I mean, I've never been sure. I've always been scared. I've always called myself a Christian, but I've never had any type of assurance in my salvation. Mm -hmm. And so like Cliff just said, I, I think it's so important to understand the cross. I, I mean, why did Jesus go to the cross if it's all about us and our own self-salvation instead? And one one uh, one spiritual writer that really helped me on this, on your great question, Kiri, is when he would when he would receive people into his office who would come for counseling and especially spiritual counseling, he would ask, how's your spiritual life? And whenever they would use that word, well, I'm trying, try, I'm trying. He would say, Oh, okay. We're, we're pretty far from understanding this whole salvation piece. And so it's not about trying. It's not about our own personal effort. Yes. It's about spiritual disciplines. So in some ways it, it is, it is a discipline and trying in that way. But it's first and foremost, understanding radical acceptance, radical surrender to God. It's all about what Jesus Christ did for us. It's really that easy. But then out of that understanding, the response is, yes, growing in the fruits of the spirit of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And having a brother or a sister say, hey, you really are growing in these areas. But we live in in all areas of life where it's all about bettering myself and competition where that seeps into our spiritual lives. And we think I just got to better myself, get better, get better. And I'll make it to heaven. God will bless me as opposed to understanding radical grace. Mm -hmm. Great response. Uh, a small pause to the questions. I think I saw, a, I saw a YouTube channel called capturing Christianity where the, the host interviewed Dr. Gary, something he's a very great yeah, yeah. He's, he's a very great historian that investigates the historical evidence and the near-death experiences and i think he is a very good historian let's let's call him to to read his books and understand better about the historical evidence for the resurrection of jesus christ and the uh, evidence for uh historical evidence for jesus mm. um Next question. What is some advice you would give to someone just being in introduced to Christianity? Yes, sir. I would encourage the person who's just been introduced to Christ to read the Gospels. It all comes down to who is Jesus. It all comes down to, am I going to grow? for the rest of my life in trusting him. Allow, allowing Christ to be the Lord, the center of my life, turns worry and anxiety into peace. It turns self-questioning and doubting oneself into a deep confidence in Christ. It turns fear into security. It turns depression and despair and disillusionment with God into hope. But what I've just said is not an overnight thing. It's a lifelong process of getting to know Christ better. And that's why I like Philippians 3.10, where the Apostle Paul, who's already known Christ for years, writes, I want to know Christ. So Paul had as his consistent drive, I want to know Christ better and better, and better. In Galatians 6.14, Paul writes, May I never boast, except 
in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, through which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. So it's real clear that the Christ denier, the Christ hater, the Christian killer, Saul of Tarsus, came to know Jesus Christ in a powerful, life-transforming way. And what continued to drive him was not some esoteric spiritual language, rather it was a desire to know Christ. Now, obviously that is difficult. I can't see Christ physically. I can't hear his voice audibly. In all of my other relationships with human beings, I can see them and hear them audibly. I can't do that with Christ. So yes, it's a spiritual relationship with Christ that I'm trying to build. And there are some similarities to my human relationships, but there are also some differences from my human relationships, like this whole issue of seeing and audibly hearing. And therefore, there's a unique challenge to getting to know Christ better. But that is why I'm so grateful that we have fellowship. We have the opportunity to talk with other believers who have their own relationship with Christ. We have the scriptures that we can read. We can go outside and look at nature and cry out, okay, Lord of creation, I want to worship you. And worship is powerful in getting to know Christ better because worship is giving my total attention to Christ, to God. But it's two steps forward, three steps back, five steps forward, one step back. It is a definite process. And so I would want to encourage that new believer to continue to get to know Jesus Christ better and better. Mm -hmm. And just to your point, I'm, I'm really glad you brought up Gary Habermas because he is kind of the foremost scholar on the resurrection. And, and that would, for me, with a new believer who has a lot of doubts, many new believers are still working through their doubts, helping them doubt their doubts, doubt their doubts. So on the resurrection point, it's simply going to be, hey, I, I've never seen a, a dead man rise from the dead. That's impossible. <laughs> okay, well, how do we doubt that? Well, we could start with Gary Habermas's incredible point on on the minimal facts and how overnight on these minimal facts that jesus was buried in joseph of arimathea's tomb that there was radical life change in the disciples that scholars will say that it is is a fact that these disciples truly believe that they saw their closest friend rise from the dead so there's there's these minimal facts that uh, almost all all secular scholars even believe and then just going down that road. And so it helps them start to doubt their doubts instead of just get stuck on a doubt and not be able to grow. Mm -hmm. I think a few days ago, I saw a post from Jordan B. Peterson that said like thinking is very hard because you have to, you have to have a point and you have to have a, a counterpoint. And because sometimes we're ignorant and we don't go and we don't want to contradict ourselves, maybe we will like, make up false arguments for the point we originally had rather than having a counter argument. So we must really try to have a battle between our different arguments in order to evolve. It's like having a debate with yourself, but that's hard because sometimes we don't want to accept that we're wrong. People don't want to accept that they're wrong. So that's mm -hmm. something very important to do. Well what is? Put. Thank you. What is some advice you would give to someone that wants to start preaching the gospel? Stick to the basics. Major on the majors, not on the minors. Don't get blown away by people's hard questions. Nobody's asked a question for the last 2,000 years that's knocked the underpinnings out of faith in Christ. Be honest with them. If they ask a hard question you don't know the answer to and say, I do not know. But I do know that I'll be out here again tomorrow and hopefully between now and tomorrow, I'll go home, study hard, and get a better answer to your hard question. Mm -hmm. But I can promise you that people have been asking hard questions for 2,000 years, and none of them have knocked the underpinnings out of the evidence that Jesus Christ is the truth. One of those specifically would be when people bring up, oh, there's contradictions everywhere in the Bible. <laughs> well, first off, those people saying that, that bald assertion, they don't know what they're what what contradictions they're even talking about. If you ask them, you'll say, "Oh yeah, which one?" Maybe they'll bring up half a verse or half a contradiction that they think is a contradiction. But to Cliff's point right there, you know, you ask Gary Habermas, you ask another one of my favorites, um, 
is the guy who just wrote Historical Reliability of the New Testament. We just had him on our show, uh, Craig Blomberg. He has just completely dissected all these supposed contradictions. And, and there's many, many scholars who have not just Christian, but secular as well. So not being blown away by that specific question, oftentimes I have in the past when I've been preaching or, or dealing with skeptics, I thought, gosh, maybe there are a lot of contradictions, but it's simply not the case. If you work through them all, there are so many incredible responses mm -hmm. that, that are not fudging the truth. Mm -hmm. Great answer. Another question that I have is that in Cyprus and Greece, we have like different type of church. Like our priests have beards. There are, there are two to three people that sing in ancient Greek, the gospel. And I see this difference from the Greek and Cyprus church preaching and compare it to the U.S. way of preaching. What is the difference? Like, why is there a difference there? Well, one of the differences between Protestant Christianity and Catholic Christianity is in Protestant Christianity, the ultimate authority is the Bible. In Catholic Christianity, it's the Bible plus church tradition. So once again, we head in the area of the importance of tradition. Now, obviously, there is some importance to tradition. It's important to study how people express their faith in Christ, how they got to know Christ better. So there's a place for that. And it's, it's inappropriate simply to throw out all tradition. But I'm afraid that too many people have gotten stuck in tradition, meaning by that they've gotten stuck in holding too tightly to a particular way of expressing faith in Christ. I am so grateful. In fact, one of the reasons that my faith is really encouraged is that in the first century, the center for Christianity was in Jerusalem. Then it went up to Antioch in Syria. Then it went down to North Africa in Alexandria, Egypt. Then it went up to Eastern Europe, then Western Europe, then over the United States. Hey, the center of Christianity is not the United States, and it's not mm -hmm. Europe. It's Africa, Asia, and South America. Point being, faith in Christ is not for one race or one tradition. Jesus Christ is the truth for every single human being on the face of the planet. Now, that's just not me sitting here as a white American, a Christian, asserting that. That's the fact. Just look at where the majority of followers of Christ are today. They're not in the United States. They're not in Western Europe. They are in Africa, South America, and Asia. And if the trends continue in the next five to 10 years, the country that will have the most followers of Christ is China. So I think the point is rather clear. We're not talking about Greek Christianity. We're not talking about American Christianity. We're not talking about Jerusalem Christianity. We're talking about Jesus Christ, who is God, who so loved the world that he bled and died on a cross to forgive us. He rose from the dead to give us eternal life. And it really doesn't matter what your ethnic heritage is. Jesus Christ is for you. If you remember, there's one point in the Bible where the disciples are tremendously offended and frustrated by a specific man who is proclaiming Christ. And they go back and tell Jesus, hey, whoa, there's, there's somebody who's not one of us who is proclaiming you and your name.